Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of Napoleon Bonaparte, right? So we are now going to be getting into a deeper discussion about what's going on with Napoleon, how his rise to the top will be cataclysmically intense, and then his fall from prestige will also be just as bad, right? So what we're going to end up talking about in this flip right now is his like movement up to the peak of his career and then how he's going to make three big mistakes and he's going to begin to come back down the other side, right? But go ahead and get into this flip. I recorded this one last year. It's absolutely fantastic. Pay good attention, though. I'm going to go ahead and post that study guide, and I'll see you all soon. Y'all have a good one. That's right. We are all up in this story about Napoleon Bonaparte, his rise to prominence, his rise to power, and his eventual takeover of the French Revolution. So this last final phase of the French Revolution that we are actually talking about is known as the Napoleonic phase. And we've gone through big chunks of it already, right? We talked about his graduating from middle school, the siege of Toulon, becoming general at the age of 28, the whiff of grape shot, re-earning the trust of the directory, going and invading Egypt, the invasion of Egypt being a failure. And then we left off right here in our last class talking about the coup d'etat of 1799, right? And so many of y'all in class like, already were gearing up and knew exactly what we were talking about. Uh, Caitlin Strimlau was talking about how like information just doesn't spread very fast at this time period. So they just hadn't heard about his loss at the Battle of the Nile yet, right? They hadn't were unaware. So when he returns back to Paris, he seizes on that popularity and he overthrows the government in 1799. That government being that of the Directory. The Directory he overthrows, and remember there's that five-man executive branch that leads the Directory who is sitting up here in the higher benches and stuff like that, and below them are all these individuals known as the Council of 500, right? The legislative branch that rules along with the Directory, and you have Napoleon entering into the room, triumphantly taking over that government and overthrowing it with his military captains behind him. And as always, he's wearing his tricolor cockade on his hat right there. And you can tell that this is a coup d'etat and stuff like that, also due to the military symbolism with the guns in the background and things like that, taking over, overthrowing the government, and establishing a new government in its place. And that new government that he will establish in the ashes of the Directory, beginning the Napoleonic phase of the revolution, is known as the Consulate. Wait a minute! Warning! Warning! We have a jumping back all the way! to the history of Rome, right? Like, so it looks like Napoleon has read a few history books in his, in his existence, and he calls himself and his government the consulate, right? What does that sound exactly like, if, if you ask me? The consuls of Rome. Remember that position that Napoleon, <clears throat> excuse me, not Napoleon, that Caesar wanted to be elected to and that he eventually got elected to in 59 BC was that of the consul of Rome, right? The consuls were the two elected officials at the very, very tip top of the Roman like government that actually led over everything and stuff like that. Well, he establishes a new branch of the French government called the consulate. Instead of two guys, he makes it three, right? For the appearance of tie breaking and veto power to make sure that there is an uneven number. But in reality, he established himself as the first consul. Because in, in reality, it's he who is in charge, right? So the big thing about it, though, is he also, like, in his early reign as consul, which is going to range from about 1799 to 1803, some big stuff is going to be going down, right? He is, the economy of France is going to begin to stabilize. He's going to have massive victories in northern Italy, where he crosses over the Alps right here, crossing over the Alps right here, to rid northern Italy of the Austrians and to rid them of anyone who might challenge France's new revolutionary power again while he's wearing that tricolor cockade on his cap, looking young, looking pristine, and jumping straight over the Alps. Now, in reality, he probably looked like this when he was actually going over the Alps and stuff like that, but we'll get to more of that here in a second. But a big thing about his entire rule as well is jumping headfirst into these ideas of what's going on during his rule and during his early reign. He's in Italy, while his legend is continuing to grow, he starts doing a lot of really big important stuff and some very dicey things at the same time, right? He starts rigging elections so he makes himself consul for life, okay? That's a big one that went down. This is actually a thing called plebiscite or a dictatorship by plebiscite. He actually allowed the French people to vote on if they wanted him to be consul for the rest of his life. And it came back in an overwhelming, over 90% approval rating of a yes vote, right? Turns out, though, that it was a rigged election, and literally his brother had organized a way to falsify a bunch of the votes and stuff like that. So he just tried to make it appear to all the French people that, actually, everyone loves me, right? Which, in reality, as we know from this other painting right here, not everybody loves you, big guy. He also is going to write a new constitution, which is a huge thing as well, because he's going to come into power, and when he writes this new constitution, he will increase his term limit and make himself a lifelong dictator, okay? That's a very dicey move as well, kind of demonstrates the fact that a man is power-hungry and is coming to power and probably will never actually let it go. He's going to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States for a whopping 15 million dollars, right? So he's going to actually sell it for about 15 million bucks, and then also he's going to try to bring back slavery in several of his colonies, 
which is really screwed up. So big thing that we need to understand is that Napoleon is not necessarily a nice guy, okay? Remember, when we look at people through a historical lens, we tend to try and say good and bad or evil and positive or whatever you want to call it, right? Now, in the grand scheme of things, he's very important to the progression of European history, but he's not personally a good dude, right? Like, if I saw Napoleon in real life, I'd punch him in the face, all right? So, because he's very, very sexist and rude to women, he's also extremely racist, and he also brought back slavery in one of his colonies so he could make more money off of them. The colony itself is the colony that you now know of, is Haiti. And we'll actually talk about it a little bit later in this class as well, talking about the slave revolt that actually turned Haiti into an independent nation while Napoleon was ruling and during the French Revolution. But he actually tried to bring it back after it had already been abolished, right? Like an absolute jerk. The Concordat of 1801 is a big one as well, though. Remember the whole cult of the supreme being thing? Remember that whole thing that actually went down when they illegalized or made illegal the Catholic Church for a little while? Well, he actually brings it back. He actually brings, like, the Catholic Church back into France using this thing called the Concordat of 1801. It says that y'all can operate here, but you have to also understand that bishoprics and taxing and stuff like that, and you're under the French rule as well, okay? And he also brings in this thing known as the Napoleonic Code. And the Napoleonic Code is a massive, massive document of laws, okay? It is a civil law code, which is going to be one of the earliest of its type that actually gets added to every time something happens. As you can see, it's a very large text. Now, the Napoleonic Code was meant to solidify certain things about the revolution itself. It gave men more rights. It gave men more voting rights. It gave men more rights to property. It gave men more rights to property and freedom from the estates. It also did a lot of other dicey things as well. It stripped the rights of women away that they had actually earned during the revolution, right? Big thing that's going to end up happening is, if we remember, is that the Women's March on Versailles demonstrated the active involvement of women during the revolution thing about it, though, is the Napoleonic Code comes in and takes away a lot of the rights that they had already earned, right? So Napoleon, again, big in history, not a good dude, though, right? So, like, look, going forward, though, as well, when we talk about it, also, you have to understand that Europe is going to begin to see him as a threat because he's taking over an area in northern Italy. He's gobbling up some territory towards the Netherlands and stuff like that in the north of France. And so, basically, the entirety of Europe is going to get together and make a thing known as a coalition, and they're going to decide to attack him, right? So, the big thing about it, you need to know what a coalition is, okay? A coalition is a massive group of countries, okay? So, basically, what happened is Prussia... Austria, Russia, and a little bit of Great Britain as well are going to start combining their armies together and combine coalition forces and start attacking France, right? Now, we've already talked about one of these wars before. We talked about the war of the first co <clears throat> the war of the first coalition when they attacked France when it was still under the rule of the National Assembly and stuff like that, way long before Napoleon ever came into power. But in 1803, he's going to be attacked and the Napoleonic Wars begin, okay? And so the thing about it, though, is, is he doesn't lose, right? He doesn't lose these wars. He actually is victorious in these wars. The French armies established occupation forces in areas like the Holy Roman Empire, which still exists at this time, and in northern Italy, which means something that, like several kids said today in class, which I was very impressed with, if you actually take over little bits and pieces of other countries and you continue to expand and grow your empire, that means, oh, excuse me, I just gave you the answer. All right, so yeah, that means you're no longer a country. You are now an empire, right? Because he has now collected territory where there are non-French speaking people and territory he did not used to own. So he's now growing into what is known as the French first empire. And all empires need an emperor, right? And so Napoleon crowns himself Emperor of France in 1804. He does this one politically to increase his power and clout, and he does it secondarily so he can actually write another new constitution where he becomes emperor, a hereditary ruler for the rest of his life, right? The big thing about it, though, is at this ceremony, which was a massive, huge ceremony where so many people came to Notre Dame in Paris to watch him be crowned emperor, right? The thing was, he even invited the Pope. There, right there, is Pope Pius, right there, sitting down on the ground, blessing the entire thing with his hands right there. But there's a really big moment that happens during the ceremony when Napoleon walks in and he's dressed like this, right? He actually walks in dressed like an emperor already. He's wearing a laurel wreath on his head, uh, like uh, going through the ideals of the Roman emperors that had come thousands of years before him, right? He walks up to the front. Pope Pius IX takes the crown and begins to actually descend it on top of his head, saying a prayer and blessing it and stuff like that, trying to actually show that God will be the one that gives you this power. Napoleon stands up in the middle of the ceremony and yanks the crown out of the Pope's hands and turns around and places it on his wife's head. Now, some of you are like, oh, does this mean his wife is now the emperor? No. Why would Napoleon do this? 
One, he's already wearing a hat and like a hat, like, like a laurel wreath with another crown on top, would just look kind of silly, right? But also due to the fact that he's trying to exert power and control over the Catholic Church that has now been welcomed back into France, right? He's saying that, no, no one will place this crown on my head. I will decide where the power it actually lies. And he placed it on his wife's head instead. And his wife's name was Josephine, right? So Josephine, a woman that he actually had married in 1796, several years before he even became emperor and stuff like that. His like long beloved, he apparently loved her so much and was the woman that he loved for the rest of his life, even though they actually got divorced pretty soon after this entire event happened, right? They got divorced because she couldn't have kids, and she actually had children from another marriage before that. See, this is what I'm talking about, about his views of women. She actually had children from another marriage that had come before that. He actually forced one of his stepdaughters, who was like in her teens, to marry one of her his brothers, who was 40-something, right? Joseph Bonaparte, which is disgusting because he basically viewed those stepdaughters as property, right? But he divorced Josephine and then ended up marrying a woman from Austria named Marie, and then what ends up happening is they have a child and he's known as Napoleon II. But interesting little fact, as you can tell with these very detailed paintings and stuff like that, the same guy who painted this famous picture of the death of Marat, which of course is right here behind me in my classroom as well, is the same imperial court painter that would paint all of his paintings, making him look grandiose as the Napoleonic Wars continue to escalate, right? So as the Napoleonic Wars continue to escalate and Jean-Paul Marat is blight, or not Jean-Paul Marat, excuse me, that guy's dead. As in, also as in Jacques-Louis David continues to paint these amazing portraits of this new emperor of France, everything starts going down and Napoleon continually wins battle after battle after battle that he faces against different coalition forces, right? Now he loses a handful, but it's a very small handful, right? He ends up losing, I think, four in the early coalition wars, and he ends up losing four towards the end of his reign, right? So the thing about it, though, in general, is Napoleon just keeps winning and occupying more and more territory. A good example of this is actually the Battle of Austerlitz, right? The Battle of Austerlitz, he actually shows up with his French Revolutionary Army and defeats a combined force of Austrians, Prussians, and Russians as well, using different tactics and flanking movements of artillery and gaining the high ground on a ridge in the middle of the battlefield and uses lightning quick strikes and overwhelming force to take over this entire group and brings Prussia and Austria under the rule of the Napoleonic forces as well, right? Which is a really, really big moment in his career. There's just a couple of battles that he did lose, like a big one was the Battle of Trafalgar, right? Now the Battle of Trafalgar, as you can tell though, it's a naval battle, so of course he lost, right? So, like, the big one is, is he actually, in the Battle of Trafalgar, tried to actually directly invade Great Britain, which was a terrible idea. Like, Napoleon, read a history book, my guy. Don't do that. The last time that happened was the Spanish Armada with Philip II, right? Don't do that. The last time the Spanish Armada tried to roll up on them, the British used fire ships, then there were storms off the backside of Ireland, and everything just went sideways. Don't try to directly invade England. No one ever does it. It never works out. The only one that's ever pulled it off is William of like, or William Prince of Orange because he was invited to show up, right? So the thing that ends up happening though is like Napoleon's naval fleet is all but destroyed at the Battle of Trafalgar by what guy? Yet again. Yes, Admiral Horatio Nelson defeats him in battle yet again. But at this time, Admiral Horatio Nelson would actually get the worst injury of his career. We actually know that Admiral Horatio is the man lying on the ground right here dying, as we can see the like sleeve, or excuse me, the armless sleeve that is pinned to his jacket right here that signifies that it is him. What had actually happened at the Battle of Trafalgar, a French sharpshooter actually shot him and it went through his shoulder blade and actually through his back and severed his spine, paralyzing him immediately. But they dragged him to his captain quarters, and he continued to give orders and lead the battle for several hours while he laid on the bed dying. Right? Like, so, like, man, Admiral Horatio Nelson is just like a military prowess and a half. Like, so, like, now, but the big thing about it, though, is, is as we can tell, he can't win naval battles, so he takes over everything he can on land. Everything outlined right here in red is the extent of the Napoleonic Empire, right? So the French First Empire took over this entire area right here, known as the Holy Roman Empire, and completely destroys it, right? Jot that down real quick. The Holy Roman Empire would cease to exist, okay? So the Holy Roman Empire, the HRE, which is this big middle area right here, which is now modern-day Germany, would cease to exist after Napoleon destroyed it in 1806, right? So basically what happened is, is he invaded and Francis the, or like Francis the Sixth of the Holy Roman Empire, who would then actually be Francis the First of Austria, ran away and stuff like that. And then literally when he ran away and abdicated the throne, he gets taken over and Napoleon turns it into the Confederation of the Rhine, right? He brings Austria underneath his rule. He brings Prussia underneath his rule as a puppet state as well. 
and he just continues to grow his influence, and a man's just not losing. And this right here is actually like an uh, image of Napoleon done again by Jacques-Louis David of him standing in front of one of his Napoleonic code drafts, in front of his swords, with his hand on the hilt right here of an object in his, or excuse me, there's like a mystery object in his hand. I can never remember what it is. I think it's like a, like a looking glass or something like that. But the big thing about it is, look at him right there. Calm, cool, collected, with his hand in his shirt, and then the twilight hours of him signing and drafting up many documents, looking like the hardworking general that he always would be. But he goes from this in about 1810 to looking like this by about 1814, right? What has happened to this guy? What is leading to his downfall? Where his downfall is pretty dramatic and pretty intense. Napoleon's downfall begins with three huge mistakes that he made, okay? One is known as the Continental System, Two is known as the Peninsular Campaign, and the third big mistake is the invasion of Russia. Big fella, don't invade Russia. Just don't. Like, everybody in history that tries to do this, never really works out for him, right? Hitler tried to do it in World War II during the Operation Barbosa. Didn't work for him either, right? Also, other people have done it in the past. The Poles done it, did it, actually, during the, like, falling of the Rurikid dynasty. Don't do it, all right? Like, it's just not a good idea. But the big thing about it is, let's start off with that first one, right? The continental system, okay? So the number one big mistake that Napoleon made when he went from having all that land to starting slowly to lose it is when he enforced a trade embargo, right? So what the continental system was is when Napoleon attempted to set up a naval blockade of the entirety of Europe, right? He attempted to set up a blockade that would actually go all the way around Europe as in, exemplified by this red dotted line right here to actually prevent Great Britain from trading with anyone on the continent, right? So there was something going on in Great Britain at the time known as the Industrial Revolution by the time that this was happening. It was reaching its peak by that time and there was a stream of products coming out of Great Britain including cheap cotton textiles and other things that people on the continent wanted as well. Like iron that is actually being created in their smelting factories in, in Great Britain as well. And all these different goods and ideas that are coming out of that country, Napoleon wants to stop that flow and he wants to try and choke out like Great Britain through their wallet. So the thing about it though is, is it doesn't really work because he doesn't have much of a navy left. After the Battle of Trafalgar, Admiral Horatio Nelson in his dying breath destroyed Napoleon's like navy and so he doesn't really have enough boats to even set the blockade up. So there's holes all over the place. And also... Britain doesn't really care about your blockade. Right? Like, so like they're going to trade with whoever's going to like actually buy products from them at this point. And secondly, they have colonies everywhere. So they can just sell to them if they need to, right? So the thing about it is that two countries in the particular are going to stab, stab is the word I'm looking for there, stab Napoleon in the back and trade with Great Britain anyway. And this includes Spain slash Portugal, because technically Portugal was allowed to actually take care of, like take over them anyway. You know what I mean? They were allowed to, but like Napoleon said, Portugal, if you trade with them, I'm going to come and invade you and bring you into my empire as well. Well, Spain also did this as well and aided Portugal in the usage of actually like trading along with Britain as well. But the biggest offender out of all of them was the continent of, or not the continent, the country of Russia, the kingdom of Russia at the time, actually traded with Britain as well. And this is going to make Napoleon furious because he's like, why are you doing this? I told you not to do this. He's getting a little too arrogant, right? And also there's this guy in the background named Charles Talleyrand that he actually like was mean to and stuff. That's a whole other like story for later on. But the big thing about them when we're looking at it is those countries traded with Britain when they weren't supposed to. So now he feels like he has to punish them, right? So Napoleon says, all right, Spain and Portugal, since you traded with Britain, I'm going to come after you. And when I'm done with them, I'm coming after Russia, okay? So he decides to try and inv like invade both. And those are his other two big mistakes. The Peninsular Campaign is the invasion of Portugal and Spain, right? So like it's the, when France tried to attack Portugal for ignoring the continental system. And over six years, what's going to end up happening, though, is Napoleon's forces were never going to get solid gains. They're never going to gain solid ground. And they're going to lose massive numbers of soldiers and battles to Spanish guerrillas. All right, so like now, this is what we need to understand really quick, okay? The Peninsular Campaign was a failure for Napoleon and drastically weakened his continental forces because Spain decided that their, their people, the Spanish people, decided we will not fight Napoleon the way he wants to fight us. The way Napoleon wants to fight is in a battle like this. He wants you to line up in your uniforms on one side of a field. He wants him to line up in his uniforms on one side of a field. They want to exchange volleys, maybe some cannon fire, a little bit of cavalry action, a charge where we meet in the middle, and then we all move on with our day. Like, so like now, the thing about it though is that's not how Napoleon was going to get fought in Spain, right? They actually instead used guerrilla warfare tactics. Locals and locals in towns and other areas would raid Napoleon's supply lines, unpronounced and unprompted, 
just like the Americans did in the American Revolution against the British, right? And you can actually see some different etchings right here. This is actually by Francisco Goya. This is actually literally a, a French soldier going to decapitate a Spanish guerrilla that's actually been arrested. And this is another Goya painting as the executions of May the 6th, where literally many guerrillas have been ousted out of this village in the background and Napoleonic soldiers are putting them in front of a firing squad, right? So it's a very intense moment in history. The Peninsular Campaign lasts for several years, but is ultimately unsuccessful for Napoleon. But nothing is as unsuccessful as his terrible invasion of Russia in 1812. And I can't emphasize enough, this is the big one. All right, so like this is the big one that destroys his army going forward. And the thing about it is we will talk all about this when I see you all again in class. Because you can't just breeze through the invasion of Russia. You got to really give it some emphasis. You got to talk about how, why you shouldn't invade Russia in the first place. And you got to talk about how Napoleon thought he had it covered. Because he was like, look, I have 600,000 men in a military. I'll be fine, right? No Russian army can stand up to my grand army, which will be made up of conscripts from everywhere I've taken over with 600,000 men. And he's like, oh, and also, I've got 10 cans to store food in now, and I've got winter clothes with 10 buttons. So take that, Russia. I got this covered. But we'll talk about the Russian response in class and why this invasion was an ultimate failure and sends Napoleon forever downward, right? I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.